I'm Karen Taylor, uh, direct, Program Director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York. And I'm so pleased to welcome you here this evening to both our in-person and indeed our online audience to our full Labour, Literature and Landmark Lecture Series. For those of you who may be less familiar with the General Society, a brief introduction. The General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen of the City of New York is a nonprofit organization that was founded in 1785 by 22 skilled craftsmen. Today, our 237 year old organization continues to serve and improve the quality of life for the people of New York City. We do this through our various educational and cultural programs. These include our Mission Free Mechanics Institute, the General Society Library, which of course our in-person audience is in this evening, the John M. Mossman Lock Museum, which um, our in-person audience is welcome to visit after the talk this evening, um, and um, our lecture series, which was first started in 1837. I want to express our thanks tonight to everyone at Rizzoli, New York, involved with the book, The Demonica Way, and indeed to Books and Call and to Alex, who will be selling uh, the Del Monaco Way um, at the conclusion of the talk. Now, tonight we are so pleased to have a lecture celebrating Del Monaco's, a legendary New York City restaurant with a wonderful history. And before I introduce Mac Tushi to you to speak to you about this iconic place, I want to mention that the General Society membership for very special occasions used to frequent Delmonico's, such as for instance, celebrating our 125th anniversary in 1910. And again, for our in-person audience, you will have seen there is a small exhibit highlighting items from that night, including a commemorative, a commemorative plate and the menu which included among many other treats that evening, bisque of lobster, fillet of beef, and fancy ice cream. We, so we are especially thrilled to be celebrating this wonderful restaurant. In this talk, Max Tushi, grandson of Oscar Tushi, the owner of Delmonico's from the 1920s to the 1980s, will discuss the distinguished history of this New York institution. Max will share how he celebrates its legacy in his glorious new book, which I just happen to have here and just happens to be for sale tonight. And our online audience can also purchase it through the Rizzoli website. This wonderful book, The Delmonico Way, some sublime entertaining and legendary recipes from the restaurant that made New York. Sorry, I'm moving it because I can see that probably I'm cutting it off for the online audience. Max Tushi is an award-winning producer and host of Max and Friends. He is a writer and a TV and radio personality and the historian of the Delmonico legacy. Max owns the largest collection of Delmonico's memorabilia. He resides between New York, Florida, Colorado, and Florence in Italy. It is such a huge pleasure tonight to introduce Max Tushi to you. Thank you, Max. Thank you, thank you, thank you. So, good evening, everyone. And good evening, everyone online. Hello, hello, hello. So before we get started, I just want to say thank you all for being here tonight. And thank you to the wonderful General Society and to Karen and Victoria, Angelo and Alex, and for everyone who's here tonight. Thank you for, um, for being here. You know, before I take a minute to, uh, to really introduce myself, I want to take a moment to just remember all of our ancestors, because I feel that their energy clearly for many of us is in this space 
but also in our hearts that um, I was able to do this book. And so for all of our ancestors, I just want to acknowledge them. They say, every time you say my name, my spirit shall be felt. So when I was writing this book, I said the name of Oscar Tucci, Mary Tucci, Mario Tucci, and Sesta Tucci probably over a million, <laughs> a million times. So um, tonight, the book, I am Max Tucci. My grandfather was Oscar Tucci, the owner of Oscar's Delmonico, as some called it. Delmonico's also Old Delmonico. And um, the subtitle of the Delmonico Way is quite an interesting subtitle. It is Sublime Entertaining and Legendary Recipes from the Restaurant That Made New York. So I'm not a chef. Let's put that on the table first and foremost. I love to cook and I grew up in the wonderful restaurant and the kitchen of Delmonico's, as well as we had one, for those that don't know, in Greenwich, Connecticut. And we'll talk about that in just a moment. The wonderful slideshow that you're seeing tonight, if there's an image that sticks out to you, remember it and we'll discuss it after the event in our Q&A, because there's some wonderful, wonderful stars from Ava Gabor and Gypsy Rose Lee and the wonderful Virginia Graham. And for those of you, I promise Virginia's granddaughter that whenever I do these lectures, I will say Virginia Graham's name. She was an incredible TV host and had a show called Girl Talk on ABC, which was really the first view. And so um, Virginia Graham was always at Delmonico's, always in a, a sable or a chinchilla and just absolutely outrageously funny, divine, and the essence of what my grandfather would call the Delmonico way. Now, one thing that I really would like to take note is then I'll read you a passage from the book. When my editor approached me on who we're going to use to have do the forward for the book, we had some wonderful A-lister names. And as things started to progress, my editor said, you know, Max, Delmonico's was before all of them. So your book will always be Max Tucci with forward by. So let's just be Max Tucci and let the forward be the restaurant. So I took some time to really think about that. And I said, no, you know, I think the forward should be my grandfather. And so when I was going through the archives that we have, which for the last 20 years of my life, I've been bringing with me from New York to Connecticut, to Florida, to Colorado. And at the point I said, why am I trekking all of this stuff with me? I didn't really appreciate it at the time. And so I was like, I like to call it Alan Menken, who's a dear friend of mine. He was at one of my lectures. I said, Alan, I felt like Ariel in The Little Mermaid. It's like, look at this trove, treasures untold. And I was opening books and there were pictures like this and Gypsy Rose Lee and autographs and all these incredible menus. I have over 4,000 menus, some that date back to the 1800s that are printed on silk for the royal family. So one may ask, why did you get all of this stuff? So before we talk about that, I wanna just get into the book for a moment and read to you the foreword from my grandfather. And the foreword reads, at Oscars Delmonico, I serve hundreds of lunches daily and grand galas and dinners. It is my aim to please my loyal clientele and give them the highest quality food prepared in an appetizing manner in an elegant atmosphere. All are welcome at my table. Oscar Tucci, 1953. And when he said all are welcome at my table, he meant all were welcome at his tables. Here's Gypsy Rosalie. <laughs> she was one that was definitely welcome at his table. But um, when we go back through the history of Delmonico's and what does that mean? What does hospitality mean? It means I see you, I hear you and you matter. And so that became the essence of the book. I wanted the reader to really be felt, to be seen, to be heard and to be told that they matter in a way that my grandfather used to welcome everyone to his tables. Kristen Jorgensen was America's first trans woman. She wasn't allowed to dine in many restaurants and my grandfather really welcomed her with open arms and said, come, after many people denied her. Lena Horne was another one. When she would be on Broadway in Jamaica, she would come down to Delmonico's and she would sing one of her favorite songs to my grandfather. I know one of them was Summertime. And um, she would always have a particular item that she loved to, uh, to nosh on before when she arrived. And so that recipe is in the book. 
There was only one person that was not allowed at my grandfather's table. And like I like to say, for you to know who that is, you have to buy the book. <laughs> so there are over 70 recipes in the book, including cocktails and food. A lot of the recipes came from the Delmonico archives that I have, from menus such as the one that we have here celebrating tonight on November 7th, 1910, was the General Society's dinner at Delmonico's. And as Karen had mentioned, thank you for mentioning all the items. <laughs> fancy ice cream is one that stands out for me. What is fancy ice cream? And so fancy ice cream, I actually have the tool that they used then. And it's a spoon without the spoon and you kind of ribbon the ice cream. So it goes into like a bow, of almost like carving butter or, or, um, or making butter. And so fancy ice cream was fancy indeed. But some of the recipes, as I am not a chef, um, some of the recipes came from some wonderful celebrity chef friends of mine, Carla Hall, who's a dear friend. I said, Carla, imagine if, and that was really the tone of the conversation with so many people. Imagine if, imagine if Ava Gabor were coming to dinner and she wanted something sweet, what would you make her? And she said, well, since Baked Alaska originated at Delmonico's, I said, we have to be careful about originated. We can say for sure that Delmonico's made it famous. And so she said, I would make her baked Alaska. So she sent me her mini baked Alaska um, treats that are in the book and also a delicious pumpkin cheesecake. Why pumpkin cheesecake? Because Delmonico's under my grandfather's ownership served a thousand lunches a day. So under that thousand lunches a day, what is magical was that cheesecake was one of the number one items on the menu to be ordered. So I said, we have to have a cheesecake and Carla gave me a cheesecake. Um, another wonderful recipe came from Andrew Zimmerman, Chef Andrew. And I said, Andrew, I really wanna bring aspic back. I said, you know, it's, it's one of those, those recipes that really aren't in many cookbooks anymore. And it was one that was always celebrated at Delmonico's. And they had so many wonderful molds to make all these different aspects. And I have some of the molds at home. So he said, I'm gonna give you my grandmother's recipe to make aspic. So as these recipes started coming in, it was like all unfolding so beautifully. Now this beautiful journey <laughs> at the end was much easier than the beginning. But what I know for sure is that with the intentions of this book and with my ancestors here, perfect timing, Mario, Oscar and Mary, I knew that this book was supposed to happen. When I was slated, gosh, 20 years ago perhaps, as one of New York's most eligible bachelors by Gotham Magazine, that meant one of two things. You're either gay or a playboy. And I said, I'm of the first. <laughs> My father was the playboy. And so um, I received a phone call from a literary agent and the literary agent said, I wanna do a bachelor's cookbook for you. And I said, great, I went right to work on it. It was called Romancing the Stove. It was gonna be amazing. We did Oh Honey Chicken, Undo My Tie. It was like the quirkiest, funniest cookbook. My agent gets pregnant, she turns it over to another agent, they drop the ball and the book never happened, which I'm glad it didn't because every step leads to the next. And so it's been 15 years that I started doing this book. And it was when I met a wonderful author named Becky Diamond. And Becky Diamond has a book called The Thousand Dollar Dinner. You can get that book right now. I know she's tuning in tonight. So hi, Becky. <laughs> and um, Becky became really uh, my go-to in helping me with the history and getting dates accurate. You know, there have been many books about Delmonico's, but many dates are inaccurate. And one of the biggest missing parts of the date of the, of the run of Delmonico's was my family's run from 1926 through the 1980s. And so in 19, I like to say when we talk about the present, we have to kind of talk about the past first. And so I look back to move forward. And by looking back, I go back to 1827. And that's when the Delmonico brothers were Swiss immigrants, Swiss Italian immigrants, came to New York and they opened their first bakery in 1827. Here's Ava Gabor and Red Buttons. <laughs> and that was 1959. And so in 1827, by 1830, they had their first fine dining restaurant, introducing the menu to the table, introducing tablecloths to the table, and introducing something that America has never seen before, fine dining. 
Now, many like to argue that statement and say that it was Francis Tavern and so on and so forth. But if we say Francis Tavern, the second word proves that it wasn't a restaurant, it was a tavern. And so Delmonico's like to hold that near and dear to, to their claim of fame. Their run was extraordinary. By 1868, on April 20th, 1868, it was the first time women were allowed to dine unaccompanied by men. Prior to that, women always had to have a man escort them. And just earlier today, I was at the Colony Club and we were talking about you know, a women's club and how there was really no place for women to go. And Delmonico's was definitely one of them. It wasn't a cakewalk for women. It wasn't until I think 1970s where women were allowed to have a credit card under their own name without their husband co-signing for them. And that's just what, 40 years ago. So by 1868, if you can just imagine all of these women joining Delmonico's for lunch, and there's a picture in the book with their enormous hats and their bustled gowns, you would wonder how they were even able to have dinner that night. <laughs> and so Delmonico's under the Delmonico brothers really changed the course of history for American dining. And by 1900s, it was still roaring. By 1910, the General Society had their dinner there. And it wasn't until 1923 where they really started feeling the aches and pains of prohibition. And prohibition really shuttered Delmonico's. And it shuttered Delmonico's, why? Many think that it was the alcohol at the bar, but in fact, Delmonico's was never a steakhouse. It was a French fine dining experience. So that means there's white wines, there's sherries, there's alcohols in the recipes that are now compromised because of prohibition. So they shuttered the doors. My grandfather had been to New York many times prior. His first journey here was in 1912 with my great grandfather Oreste. They came from Florence, Italy to journey here to experience all that New York had to offer. What we say in Florence with my Florentine accent, the sogno americano, the American dream. And so my grandfather really strived for that American dream. And in 1926, my grandfather bought Delmonico's. It was shuttered, it was closed, it was slated to be knocked down, the building, which is at 56 Beaver Street at the corner of Beaver and South William. And what's fascinating about the building is that today it still stands. It has been um, redone many times, obviously, but um, it was a building that when he stood at in front of, with those double doors, he dreamed of something bigger than himself. He knew the history of Delmonico's, he knew the brothers, and he knew that he wanted to continue this legacy to keep Delmonico's known as the restaurant that made New York. And so when you journey through this Italian man's dream, daydream of coming from Florence, Italy to New York to take over this restaurant, it was a noble task. It wasn't easy for sure. And it was kind of like my journey with this cookbook. Um, but my grandmother in 1926, Sesta Beneforti Tucci, helped my grandfather and his dream. And so when you look at Delmonico's and you say, well, prohibition is still happening, what did your grandfather do? My grandfather was clever and he had a speakeasy, which was downstairs at Delmonico's. And my grandmother in her fox trim coats would push my father's pram through the streets of downtown New York with alcohol inside and bring it to the side entrance. And he started really understanding that the clientele was the most important, that hospitality was so incredible and that you have to welcome everyone to your table. And so he welcomed them to his speakeasy. By 1933, which you'll read in the book, Oscar received his third liquor license, the third liquor license in New York actually. So it was his first, but the third one to be issued in New York. And then he really started taking over the, the, the culinary industry. The building at the time, the upstairs floors, they were offices for immigration and for ship insurance and for you know, various types of business. But my grandfather saw beyond that. And so it was uh, not long after that he purchased the entire building, 70,000 square feet, and ran the restaurant in the entire building. There were rooms that were called the Python room, the Baroque room, which is where King Umberto used to come and dine, the Palm room, which is the great dining room you'll see in just a moment upstairs, upstairs on the screen. And um, it was such a magical place. He even turned the penthouse on the top floor into um, an apartment living space. 
And then he had transitioned it later on into the private dining room, which was the boudoir for uh, some of Hollywood's elite, shall we say in the book you'll read, uh, Rock Hudson was one of them. So the front door was his beard as was Elizabeth Taylor and the penthouse was his playground. And I didn't wanna put that in the book, but um, my editors and publisher were like, we have to share these stories because if we don't share them, who will tell them? And so that goes to saying that we're all storytellers. And here's that great dining room, which was the palm room. And the center table was always reserved for my father. In the background, there was a grand Steinway piano, is the piano where Lena Horne performed at, where Kristen Jorgensen performed, and Ava Gabor was known to sing a tune or two. Green Acres was probably one of the songs. And, um, and just such a, it was such a clever and fun environment. Um, there's Ava Gabor and Red Buttons. So, if we look through really the next, the, the decades of Delmonico's, which I like to call them, um, the 1940s, we're in war and yet Delmonico's is still serving meals. And then we get into the 1950s, which was the most glamorous era, which really the book evokes that period of, of 1950s Hollywood glamour and really this elegant, sophisticated uh, environment. And so Roberto de Vic de Compich, that's his real name, is my book designer. And he was the assistant to Jackie Onassis when he first came to America. And he said, I know exactly what I'm gonna do with this book. And so when they turned over the first uh, print to me, I was like, wait, this looks like Vogue magazine. <laughs> like what's going on? And there's so much masculine energy in Delmonico's, but we have to remember the women that were working there. My grandmother being one of them, my Aunt Mary, which we called the Iron Fist with the lace glove, was in charge of finances. Um, Lelo Arpaia, who was Donatella Arpaia's father, worked at Delmonico's, and he would tell me that my Aunt Mary had eyes in the back of her head. And if someone had ordered 150 lamb chops and there were 90 served, there better be the, the rest of them or there was going to be trouble with Mary Tucci. And um, so she was, she was really the the person, she was my Auntie Maine. She would always watch Turner classic movies. There's Virginia Graham in her chinchilla and ostrich dress. But she would always watch Turner classic movies with me. Life with Father, Girl with the Yellow Ribbon, uh, Hello Dolly, Frankie and Johnny, where Elvis sings, no more, uh, no more dining on Sloppy Joes. We're gonna have steak and wine at Delmonico's. No more hot dogs and Sloppy Joes. <laughs> There's that steak and wine that he was gonna dine on. And so it was really an interesting childhood. Growing up, I never knew that Delmonico's was Delmonico's. To me, it was just my family's love. My mother called it my father's third wife. And there's, there's a caricature of my father. So 1950s was really one of the most poignant times for Delmonico's. 1960s. The 1960s proved to be a, a wonderful time for the restaurant. My grandfather really was putting so much into it. And between the 1950s and 60s started really the, the mentorship for some of the finest restaurateurs that we know today. Ciro Maccioni, that was his, uh, his pasta primavera. Ciro Maccioni came to New York, was looking for work after working on a ship. He was a cruise liner and worked on the cruise liners. And he came into the restaurant and said to my grandmother in Italian, Tuscan, that he was from the Tuscan region and my grandfather hired him on the spot. And my grandfather then put set forth that anyone who comes to Delmonico's as and looking for employment from Italy, especially Tuscany, will have a job here. So Tony May, who had San Domenico and also the Rainbow Room, he and Palio and so many SD26 and the list goes on with his daughter Marissa May, but Tony May also first worked at Delmonico's. So under my grandfather's legacy and my father's legacy, these two gentlemen worked and they performed excellent. Um, excellence was really something that my father and grandfather strived for. And Sirio Maccioni was placed in the palm room and also in the Baroque room, like I had mentioned earlier, when King Umberto would come, Sirio was always there. So if you could just imagine what the energy was like, lunch is a thousand lunches a day. Dinners, however, were not so um, filled <laughs> with clientele. A lot of people, like tonight, don't want to come to Midtown, let alone downtown. <laughs> so there was a lot of struggle to get people downtown to Delmonico's. 
So my grandfather and my father were super clever and they had, my grandfather loved Cadillacs. And so they had some Cadillac limousines and they would transport people from Upper East Side, Midtown, down to Delmonico's. And then my father took it one step further by having our yacht, which was called the Firebird, um, do dinners on the river down by the Statue of Liberty, these Delmonico, what I call today the Delmonico Way dinners. And so Oscar and Mario really were the ones, the keepers of this Delmonico history. And then 1970s, 1969, Oscar Tucci passes away. And my Aunt Mary and my father, Mary had been working in the restaurant since she was 15 years old and they were ready to say what next. And so that's when my father, who was definitely known as the playboy, who would always take his, his dates from Delmonico's to the store club or Copacabana or wherever, would then jump into a Jaguar and then just head down to Delmonico's and have these amazing seafood towers. Um, he was very friendly with the uh, Hugh Hefner and the Playboy Club and they said, we need to spice things up a little bit down here. And so they did. Um, and then in the 1970s, that's when my father met my soon to be his wife, my mother. And my mother at the time was working in fashion. She was the executive vice president for Roberta Di Camerina. She opened the store with Onassis at the Olympic Towers. She also had Jaeger on Madison Avenue, that was her store. And then she was the president for Maximilian Furs, which is how I got my second name. And then also Ritter Brother Furs. So my mother was a woman's wear daily. Every, she was constantly in Women's Wear Daily under the name Gina Martini, And um, that was her maiden name. So growing up, we always used to joke with my mother saying she had the best drag name in town, Gina Martini. And there's gin and martinis in her name. So when we were doing the book, I put the Gina Martini in the book for my mother. And she wasn't so pleased, but <laughs> c'est la vie. <laughs> and so my mother really and my father, when my father married my mother, Delmonico's really became our, his family, it was our family. And um, we at the time were living at 1165 Park Avenue, which is the, the apartment that Sierra Maccioni was married in with Edgy. And um, then 1970, I was 79, I was born. 1980, crack comes into New York and starts really wreaking havoc, especially downtown. And my father was deeply concerned about people not coming for dinner anymore. Uh, the Wall Street area, and especially down by Delmonico's, where we write in the book, there was gangs and murders and drugs were on the rise. And it really started shaking up New York. If we remember how grungy New York used to be with those amazing now um, spray painted subways and just imagine having a fine dining restaurant and trying to get past that. So my grandfather, uh, my father, who at the time also had a house in Greenwich, Connecticut, which he purchased in 1963 said, Greenwich is the new uptown. And so he took us to Connecticut and he opened another Delmonico's in Greenwich, Connecticut. And that restaurant in 1983 and 84 became the hot spot of fine dining outside of New York where the New York Times, uh, the restaurant was one of the first restaurants in Connecticut to be acknowledged by the New York Times. And so my father really loved the industry. He loved hospitality. And he constantly talked to me about Delmonico's. I remember reading the New York Times and it says, little Max is growing up in Delmonico's, cleaning the ashtrays and checking the light bulbs and making sure the plates aren't chipped, which has become my demise. And it's very hard for me to go to dinner because I constantly look for light bulbs and chip plates. <laughs> and um, that's one of my struggles eating out. <laughs> but so it was, um, it was a fascinating childhood and growing up, if you could imagine, you saw Virginia Graham and her chinchilla, all of these women and stars and starlets would come and they would hang their coats, which was another uh, labor that I had to do at the restaurant. My sister, perfect timing. My sister, my mother and I, I mean, hello, <laughs> little mags in those outfits. That was the Greenwich restaurant. So I was always with my sister and we were hanging up these fur coats. And then we decided that the coat room would be our new playroom. And so you'll read in the book that we threw all of these sable and chinchilla on the floor and we would pass out on them like the starlets on Turner Classic Movies until one day my mother walked in and had a fit and that was the last time we were allowed to hang up any fur coats. <laughs> so our next journey was stealing all of the pastries and bringing them upstairs in my Aunt Mary's office and indulging on them. 
Uh, it was really, I call my life, if you know the movie, The Big Fish, where without spoiling the movie, but spoiling the movie, because it's so old, um, there was an, a, an elderly man in the film and he's talking to his son, he's on his deathbed and he's telling all these incredible stories and the son is like, this man is crazy. And so imagine growing up telling people, my grandfather created the wedge salad. The other like, Max is a little crazy. <laughs> you know, these Greenwich folk. And so um, it was an interesting childhood. And I call my movie, my life, like the movie Big Fish. And then eventually when this elderly man passes in the movie, everyone he talks about was at his funeral. When I did my first author talk at the Keeler Library in North Salem, New York, I felt like that was almost my wake, <laughs> but I was still living. I'm standing there and all of these people that meant so much to me in my life were there. And it was so emotional to see that because this book was rejected 20 times, 20 times, saying that Delmonico's wasn't relevant, my numbers weren't big enough on social media. On my show, Max and Friends, I interviewed a wonderful woman by the name of Sherry Salada. Sherry Salata was the executive producer for the Oprah Winfrey show for 25 years. And she wrote a book called The Beautiful No. And now I know that the beautiful no leads to the divine yes. And it wasn't until about 10 years into the book when I was told no, 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 no. It was no, no, okay, okay. I always smile on my face. Rejection is protection. I'm gonna make it through, not a worry. I have to keep going and tell my grandfather's story and my father's story. And it was in 2019 when a friend of mine who we know is Whoopi Goldberg wrote a book with Rizzoli and the book is titled The Unqualified Hostess. I do it my way so you can do it yours. And I said, hey, Whoopi, she has a big affection for Delmonico's and has taught me so much about the restaurant outside of my family's uh, perspectives. And I said, well, let's throw a party for you for the book at Delmonico's. 2019, it was the last time I threw a party for anyone in Delmonico's because then we know the pause happened. And so in 2019, I'm standing in this building at 56 Beaver Street, bless you. And um, I'm doing my thing. I'm feeling my ancestors there, the energy of them. And I'm like, this is incredible that I'm here hosting a party for Whoopi Goldberg. Like, who have I become? <laughs> Why now? And in walks Charles from Rizzoli. And I see him coming through the room. I'm like, that song, The Man of Distinction is playing in my head. And I'm like, here he comes. And so I look at Charles and he's observing me and I'm looking at him and I'm selling the book for Whoopi. We're having a great time. And Charles walks over for those of you who know him and he looks at me and he goes, Max, why don't you have a book? And I said, well, Charles, I paused. And it was this ancestral thrust that pushed me forward. And I looked at him, I said, that's because you haven't published it. And I was like, where did that just come? <laughs> I just can't believe I just told Charles from Rizzoli, you haven't published my book. And I took it one step further. And I said, and I'll take a meeting with you tomorrow at three o'clock, my agents here from Curtis Brown. And I figured all these divine, beautiful no's are gonna turn to that yes, because I'm in the place where the magic happened in Delmonico's. And so he goes, I'll take your meeting. And I was like, how you doing? <laughs> in the words of Wendy Williams, how you doing? And so I sent my agent who was there and, and um, we made the appointment and I showed up at the appointment, like I said, I would. And Charles basically, I'm paraphrasing, said, here's why those no's happen. Because you're not telling the story through your eyes, through your perspective, through growing up in America's first fine dining restaurant. The stories, do we know the, the movies, the April Fools, the picture before was, was a wonderful picture in the polka dot dress. That was the divine Cindy Adams. And so here's the picture. We'll talk about the picture later. So I was like, here I am in Rizzoli office. And my mother said this years ago, she put that seed into the ground and said, there's no other publisher for you but Rizzoli. Rizzoli has to publish the book on Delmonico's. Asseline wanted to do a book with me, but they wanted me to pay them. And I was like, but where's my advance? <laughs> so I learned that this, this industry is one that's cutthroat, but those every step lead to the next. And I could feel my grandfather saying, avanti, avanti. And my aunt Mary saying, don't give up. And so I didn't. And when I started working with Becky on the book, we really had 
so many marvelous times together. We wanted the dates to be accurate. We wanted the history to be accurate. We wanted the recipes to be legendary. We wanted the entertaining to be sublime to the simple things that my grandfather would do when he made his wedge salad that he created, he would put the dishes in the refrigerator and take it one step further by putting the cutlery, the forks and the knives in the, in the refrigerator. So that when you got your salad, the plate was cold, the forks were cold, and it just made that salad taste so much better. Speaking of the wedge salad, I wanna bring this up. I'm not a fan of tomatoes. My editor, Caitlin, is one of the biggest fan of tomatoes. So I was like, oh boy, here we go. <laughs> this is, this, this is a, the little rut in the road. And so, my favorite wedge salad is at La Galou in New York, and they're also in Palm Beach now. So I called the chef and I said, I would love to have this recipe in the book. He said, absolutely, it's Delmonico's. And so he replaces tomatoes with figs. So I'm like, anyone who can put a fig in the placement of a tomato is my kind of a guy and chef. And so we have that recipe in the book. And again, there's just such a, a rich history that Delmonico's offered from my childhood for my family, for New York, for Sierra Maccioni, for Tony May. And when I look back at my grandfather and the photos that I see of him, I see this really jolly kind man that I never met before. And through all of these interviews that I've had with people over the years, everyone had one common word for my grandfather. And they said he was kind. And that's what the hospitality industry is missing today, that kindness that those words, I see you, I hear you, you matter, all are welcome at my table. So I felt this was the time and Rizzoli did too. And we rolled our sleeves up during the pause and we got to work. And when this book arrived, I was um, in Florence, Italy at the time in my grandfather's villa and my father's villa and fourth generation, so my villa now. And I opened the package and inside was this book. And I wept. <laughs> I was like, oh my God, it's finally here. It's the elephant birth. And so for me to write this book is more powerful than the recipes in it. It's more powerful than the photos are in it. And the power of this book is that it teaches. Maya Angelou once said, when you learn, teach. When you learn, teach. And so I want to teach the reader what Delmonico's meant to New York, what it means to society, what the recipes mean, what the cocktails mean, what celebrating one another means, what entertaining means, and what hospitality means. And so all lined up, the universe rose up to meet me, where I was in a place where I could literally take my glory and run. And that's the book, The Delmonico Way, Sublime Entertaining and Legendary Recipes from the Restaurant that made New York. And I thank you all for being here tonight. Are we good on time? We're good on time. Okay, thank you all. <laughs> thank you. And thank you for watching all. There's a huge audience um, that's online. So New York is raining tonight. If for those of you who aren't here, you're not missing much by being in the city, but when you're here next time or you're visiting the city, my little PSA, you have to come and see this space. It's incredible. Max, thank you so much on so many levels. I mean, what a wonderful story. The beautiful no, I think we will all remember it. I will save more of my comments until the end, okay. but I would like to take some questions now. I want to remind our online audience that, that you should submit uh, your questions uh, through the uh, Q&A section, but I'd be more than happy to take questions from our in-person audience. Wonderful. I'm ready. <laughs> So my question is about the building and with all these different dining areas, mm -hmm. was there one central kitchen? Yes, there, there was. Could you maybe give a little description I'm, of how thank many you people for asking work that. there and you know how that worked? Because it sounds like Indeed. very complicated uh, logistics. It was very complicated. And thank you for that question. There was one main kitchen, which was downstairs um, in the basement of the building. And there was a dumb waiter in the building, which is still there. 
which my mother would say, don't go near it because it will bring you right to hell. And so I would always like peek in and then peek out. It's like the movie Watchers, if you've seen it, that dumb waiter is just there. But um, the kitchen was downstairs. And one of my favorite stories about the kitchen is from Lelo Arpaia. And he was telling me, I was at Delmonico's working for your grandfather and your aunt Mary was downstairs in the kitchen that day. And I had a tray of Janori. They serve Janori on Janori dishes. And he goes, and I'm running downstairs with the tray and my heel catches the step and I slide down the stairs and I'm holding the tray and nothing breaks. And your aunt Mary stands there and looks at me with the arms on the hip and said, good job, you didn't break anything. <laughs> So the staff was enormous. There were times when the staff would be anywhere from about 70 to 80 to up to almost 200, depending on if it was a gala and there were a lot of people. So it was really an incredible institution with this kitchen. And the historical photos that I have of the kitchen really paint the picture that it was not the first kitchen like many restaurateurs have today. My grandfather loved air conditioning, especially being from Italy where they didn't really have it. And so he, he installed air conditioning at one point. So he was always keeping his staff you know, happy. But the rest of the kitchen was downstairs. It was a nightmare to work in. Kitchen nightmares has nothing on the Delmonico original kitchen. So it's a great question. Thank you. How difficult was it to uh, get an, uh, a reservation? And you mentioned you had a staff of 70 so up to 200. Yeah. What was the standard staffing and what were the hours of the restaurant and what kind of revenues to make it's very very fascinating story great it. well i love that question reservations were by a phone number back then in new york they had letters in them so delmonico's was bowling green so sometimes it would be bowling 135 so you would call then the operator would put you through <laughs> and um dinner reservations were a lot easier because no one was really coming downtown to wall street to dine now, if Gypsy Rose Lee showed up and the word got out, obviously more people came. But there was a no paparazzi rule also at the restaurant. So by that, it meant that celebrities can come there, unlike the store club, unlike Copacabana, unlike El Morocco, where photographs were, you know, were the thing, they knew they could hide out at Delmonico's. And so that kind of upped also the, the reservation where you would have to, you know, kind of reserve in advance. But when you have the, the great socialites of New York, there's always a table available. Even in New York today, there's always a table available. You know, the hype of there's nothing available for six months. There's always something. But um, so reservations were, were taken. During lunchtime, um, the Harvard Club had their private room there. Lehman Brothers had a room there. So a lot of the men had their own spaces where they knew that they could have a table. The bar was natural places for reservations. Delmonico's is the first restaurant under my grandfather to have the ticker tape machine so that the gentleman didn't have to leave. So now the buzz is happening and the lunches and that's why my grandfather naturally had to start expanding upstairs because they were just becoming so so filled with lunch. And the staff, that's a very interesting question. Um, before the union, the staff um, were predominantly Italian immigrants, like my grandfather. Um, and when Delmonico's, this funny story, again, that Lelo Arpaia told me, he has a great memory. Um, he said that when the union came into Delmonico's and there was a server there who mouthed off to my father and gave him the F word, um, Tony May, who said to me not so long ago that my father could never own a restaurant today because he slapped the waiter <laughs> and said, never disrespect me again. The union supervisor shows up the next day and says to my father, I'm fining you $5,000. This is in the 1960s. So my father said, okay. He lined up everybody and the union supervisor was there. And he said in front of the union supervisor, if anybody says the F word to me again, find me twice because I'm slapping you twice. Now, when we hear that story, yes, it sounds outrageous. But when you're having presidents dine at Delmonico's, when you're having royalty dine at Delmonico's and socialites, there's zero room for error. And so the staff, every morning they would line them up, the haircut, if your hair wasn't properly cropped, you went home. If your nails weren't clean, you didn't work. If the buttons, the frog buttons that held their jackets together weren't polished, they would have to go downstairs and polish them. So it was a very strict 
um, protocol that my grandfather and father instilled. So it was, it was quite the, uh, the establishment. Uh, a friend of mine in Italy said, if you take out every recipe, this is a screenplay. You have to, <laughs> this is like a docu-series, Delmonico's, the decades of Delmonico's. So thank you for those questions because, yeah. The revenues allowed me to grow up in Greenwich, Connecticut, in Florence, Italy, on 1165 Park Avenue. Um, so, <laughs> and at 23 by a Bentley. And I don't say that to boast. I say that because my grandfather and father worked so hard that it was like, I, it was just outrageous to think that when my father died when I was eight years old, that I would like come into this Delmonico fortune. And so growing up, I think really that's why Got the Magazine made me one of New York's most eligible bachelors. But it was, they were very lucrative and they even expanded to Florence, Italy. My father had a, a wine and spirit store import service in Florence, Italy. So thank you. Yes. Max, uh, do, is there a place where people gather together like past employees or people who dine there? and speak online, you know, people share their memories. Have you facilitated yeah. that? And my second question is, do you find, well, what's your favorite restaurant? Uh, <laughs> sorry. And <laughs> are you able to dine in peace because you are so aware of all of the imperfections? <laughs> I love those questions. So the first to answer the first question, unfortunately, we're in a period of time now where a lot of the old staff from Delmonico's has passed. Tony May being the most recent just over the summer. And um, I could literally weep now because Tony stepped in as my father when my father passed. And also Sierra Maccioni, we were just with Edgy in, in Italy. And um, these men were such a vibrant part of society and the, the hospitality industry. So Lelo Arpaio, when I did my, um, my book launch on November 1st at the Rizzoli store in New York, which was fantastic because they gave me their entire storefront and we recreated Delmonico's in those windows. And there's a room, standing room only, they had to shut the room, there were so many people. And I'm viewing and scanning the room and I see Lelo Arpaia. And I had to pause, Pamela Fury, who was the, the former editor in chief of Town and Country was the moderator. And she's asking me a question and she's like, oh, something's going on in Max's head. And I said to Lelo, I said, Lelo, you have to come on stage. We have to give you your flowers now. You're like the last one standing. And so it was an emotional time because these, these men don't exist anymore. And Fedora, if those who live in the village know the old Fedoras, Fedora used to work at Delmonico. She was my Aunt Mary's best friend. And she first worked as the coat check. And growing up, we would always celebrate at Fedora's. And what I love about Fedora is that she understood hospitality as well. And um, during the HIV AIDS pandemic in the early 80s, um, Fedora used to hand feed her clients who were, who were sick and dying and that she learned from Oscar. And so to not be able to have Oscar or Sesta, my Aunt Mary who died when I was like 17, who shared, she was my Auntie Mame. She taught me everything. And then Fedora passing and then Sirio and then Tony and now with Lalo, it's, it's so sad that we don't really have those to share their stories with. Um, however, Cindy Adams did write a piece for me about five or six years ago. And she said, if anyone has stories on old Delmonico's in old New York, write them, not me, Cindy. So I call it a thank her and she goes, that was for your father, not you. So when are we going to lunch? <laughs> so I received so many wonderful stories. Today, when I was at the Colony Club, this lady, she says, I have a picture at home of my grandmother's wedding at Delmonico's. And so those are the stories, you know, that we have to keep telling, you know, and that's what keep old, that keeps old New York alive. And that's what this book is. You know, the, the New York Daily News said, Max Tucci recreates the era of lush luxuries in the Delmonico way. And so I feel like in that vein, we have to ask people, you know, what are your stories of institutions? You know, there's a wonderful blog called Jeremiah's Vanishing New York. And old New York is vanishing. And we need to preserve those stories. So that's a great question. And there was a gentleman that showed up to my North Salem author talk. 96 years old, Robert. And he says, I'm going to say three names, Oscar, Mary, and Mario. And I said, 
He goes, your grandmother, great grandmother, didn't want your grandfather to be in this industry. So when he was successful, he bought a Cadillac, sent it to Italy so he could give her a ride in it. And I was with him. And he goes, and I don't know if you ever seen your old family videos. Now, my grandparents, I think, were like the first Kardashians. We have rolls of footage. This man, when he was a child, like 15, teenager, would travel with my grandfather and family to Italy and recorded all of their family holidays. And I have those reels. So it's stories like that when he walks in and says these names that it floors me. When it comes to eating and dining, my favorite restaurant, can you keep a secret? So can I. <laughs> um, when it comes to eating, it is difficult. It's difficult in this sense. You know, I love staying home and, and like, you know, I love, you know, if I can go to a restaurant where there's a lot of um, entertainment, you know, like if we can get as cheesy as like um, uh, hibachi. <laughs> it's just fun to be in that environment. But um, it's difficult for me for a few things. Number one, starting with being gracious. If I don't feel welcomed in your restaurant, when there's so many to choose from, why be there? And so I'm not asking for anything special. I'm asking what all of us want. Do you see me? Do you hear me? Do I matter? We're choosing your institute, your restaurant to celebrate our dinner in. And so it really starts there. And then if there's a chip plate, I say, I grew up in Delmonico's, your, your plates are chipped, you have to throw them out. <laughs> so, you know, Keith, who's my husband here, he knows that it's very difficult to, uh, to go out to dinner with me sometimes. Not that I'm a pain in the ass, but that I just notice things and I want places to really be celebrated. We're going out. We don't have to go out. We can stay home and cook, especially with the Delmonico way. <laughs> so thank you for your questions. There was a question back there. Um, I'm going to come to you, but I just have a few online questions. Sure, I would love like, online just questions. To, just to give our online audience. Great, hi, online a, audience. A, a chance. Um, now, the, the, the first one, this was quite similar to the one in the building, but were there also offices in the Delmonico building? Oh, who, who, do we know who asked that question? Yeah, Judith. Hi, Judith. So here's what I'm going to share with you. I was doing my author photo that's at the end of this reel uh, not too long ago. It was during pandemic and I was in front of the building. And when I was there, this gentleman keeps walking by and I'm thinking, okay, this is getting a little weird. Why is he walking by so many times? And so by the end of the photo shoot, I said like, do we know one another? And he said, oh, who are you? Is like, what are you doing here? I said, well, who are you? And he goes, I live in the building and there's apartments there now. And so I said, really, what floor are you on? He said, I'm on the fourth floor. I said, that was my grandfather's office. And so he said, well, do you wanna come and see where we live? So I said, absolutely. So he brought me upstairs and I saw my grandfather's office for the first time, which was converted into an apartment um, in over, gosh, however many years. And so there were offices. Um, my Aunt Mary had her office in the back of the book. Um, and I'll share with a picture with you. Uh, there's a photo of, and Roberto wanted this to be last, the photo. He said, your grandfather served all these glamorous people. And at the end of the day, he would sit downstairs in the receiving room on a crate and eat his dinner. <laughs> so that was his office downstairs. That's how humble he was. And my father, a little bit opposite, his office was also upstairs, but he had his desk put on a platform so that he would appear taller. <laughs> so um, the restaurant did have office space. And Travis, who introduced me uh, to my grandfather's office so all these years, came to, one of my, uh, came to my home in North Salem and he brought me a gift. And the gift was a piece of the cornerstone of the building from downstairs underneath. He went to the basement of the restaurant and brought me a piece of the stone. So I always have that with me. Their offices were there. Lehman Brothers, actually, they were going to have their offices there as well, uh, but it never progressed. And I do have the, the blueprints of the Lehman Brothers offices that were intended to be there. So thank you for the question. Like another online question. Um, you mentioned that the book includes uh, recipes from other chefs, but are there any original Delmonco recipes in the book? And this is from Rena. Rena, yes, yes and yes. And they're from cocktails from the classic Delmonico cocktail to my grandfather's cocktail, which he, in 1963, I think, gave up his secret how he made it. We also have a lot of the original recipes from my grandfather's wedge salad 
to um, the Delmonico steak. Now, even though there's interpretations of the, a lot of the recipes, these were all classic recipes at Delmonico's. Oysters Rockefeller is in the book. Um, there's really some wonderful recipes that we compiled. There are pasta recipes, the Bolognese recipe. And so we do have some of the original, we had to have original uh, recipes from Delmonico's in the book. Um, who was the person here? The lady right oh, next to you. Um, I was wondering if the concept of what hospitality currently is, is different and how is it different and is it a mistake that it's different? Okay, so this will get me in trouble and it's worth it. My belief is that when the chef became the celebrity and people started dining to experience the chef is when the industry changed. Prior to that, my grandfather never had a celebrity chef. The clients were always the celebrity, whether they were famous or not. And so I think really that's when the industry of hospitality started changing, when people expected you to show up because of who they are, as opposed to show up because of who you are. And so I think that was one of the biggest disconnects in the industry. Um, and yes, I have celebrity chefs in the book, but I think that's where the change started happening. Also, I believe, from my grandfather's famous quote of all are welcomed at my table. When we stop welcoming all to the table and when we turn people away, I think as humans, we feel that. We feel that we're not appreciated. Now I'm not saying dress up in sables every night with diamond dripping like uh, Gypsy Rose Lee, but self-worth has a lot of aspect to it as well. And so we're in a climate now where you know, there's technology is taking over and we're forgetting what glamor was. We're forgetting what hospitality means. We're forgetting that when we celebrate each other, our dinner tastes even better, right? And so for me, I think that's, that's when the disconnect happened. Uh, I was asked a question recently about glamor and the young lady said, how do we find glamor these days? And I said, very simply, if you want glamour, you have to be the glamour. Bring it. Bring that glamour back. So it really becomes our responsibility to heighten the experience and to raise the frequency. Is anybody, or not anybody, but is there any example of that? Or Yes. And I mentioned in the book, the polo bar, Nelly. If those of you who know Nelly, she's a bright star for the future of food and hospitality. Omar Hernandez is a wonderful example of uh, one of, I think, is going to be one of the biggest names in the industry, per se, is one of the restaurants. Um, Houston's, I love old Houston's, it's like perfect. You know, the, the customer's always right, there's never a problem. Right away, if something's not right, they'll fix it for you, they celebrate you. So I do mention the surf club, some of the restaurants, um, San Ambrose, I feel the Palm Beach one in particular is so welcoming and their standard of food is wonderful and they, they celebrate uh, the individual. So there are, I mentioned in the book that the Delmonico way hasn't completely been stripped away, that I do see evidence of my grandfather's teachings. Um, naturally with Sirio and Tony May, they were, well, if anyone ever experienced San Domenico restaurant on 59th street, you know you're nodding your head. The white truffle gala, Tony would always make room for anyone. So, you know, it's hospitality is vanishing. And I think it's up to us to start asking for it back. Thank you. Right, I have a, another online question. Mm -hmm. And this is in fact from one of our previous lecturers. Um, and this is from Jackie Ottman. And Jackie spoke about her family's meat purveying business here in mm -hmm. her lecture and indeed about the history of the meatpacking district. So basically her question is, would you have, and she's curious to know, mm -hmm. would you know, um, it, it's very, very likely Altman and company mm -hmm. were the yeah. leading meat for, that, that, would you know, do you have records of that? Would there have been a supplier to you? So to Del Monco, Del that's Monco? a great question. And what I know for sure through records that I do have is that my grandfather, thank you for the question. My grandfather traveled to Staten Island for produce. <laughs> he, sat into, he went to Bridgeport, Connecticut, and he had one of, he had the first, refrigerated vehicles that he can go to farms and get produce from. When it comes to meat, which is the question, 
it's it's difficult to to find actual receipts from purveyors. It's one thing that we don't have many of. Um, but from photographs, we can kind of see brandings and like for a lot of the, the produce where they came from. So my grandfather loved obviously downtown and the meatpacking district and the fish district. So he and my, my uncle Gigi Beneforti, they would, they would really search the, the area for the, the best purveyors and use them. So thank you. Hi, Max. Tough. I have a bazillion questions okay. for you. You're bringing back <laughs> a lot of memories. I've known Tony May, and now I know where he got his finesse from. So thank you for, thank you. for that. So I, I have two questions because um, I remember the name Delmonico, you know, for most of my adult life, and I've always associated it with the Delmonico State. Mm -hmm. Was that the number one requested no. It's a great question. And before we start, thank you. I have you. another one that we'll right. that. Okay. okay, I'll answer that one, then you'll throw please, me the other one. Please. So we have to mention Tony May again, just be, since you knew him and I loved him and he was like a father to me. His daughter, Marissa May, is doing wonderfully. She'll be opening another restaurant right. next year. So we're excited about that. Um, the last 30 years of Delmonico's run is where it started really be, becoming called a steakhouse, which my mother would joke that if there was an earthquake in New York, it's my grandfather rolling in his grave because it was never a steakhouse. It was always fine dining. And so for advertising purposes, for the, the previous owners and operators, it's easier to call Delmonico's a steakhouse because of the cut. Now in the book, there is a lot of discrepancy about what is the Delmonico steak. So there was a wonderful article by mash.com and they wrote, any steak that's served at Delmonico's is a Delmonico steak. <laughs> so I like to take that. My mother likes to say it's a bone in ribeye. Um, some say bone, you know, boneless, regardless of, you'll read in the book uh, a little bit more about the history of that. And indeed Delmonico's was not a steakhouse. So thank you for that question. Cause there's been a lot of, from my family's error. It was never a steakhouse. This question now is, is kind of is is mostly for you because you talked about you talk about dining and how you're very particular. <laughs> I have a real pet peeve when I go to a restaurant and if someone in my group is not finished eating, mm. there's a tendency to take away the empty plates, leaving mm -hmm. that one or maybe mm -hmm. possibly two people sort of eating by themselves. I just can't stand that. And then usually I speak up. So was that allowed at Delmonico's? No. You know about you this. Know, do, you, do you know the movie Clue? There's a scene yeah. where the woman is standing there and she goes, fire, f fire, fire is coming out of my ears, <laughs> right? That's how I feel in those moments too. Like fire <laughs> is coming out of my ears. No, you know, Emily Post. <laughs> who um, would approved of many things Oscar did, teaches many great etiquette standards. And etiquette is something that's very uh, interesting because it's been interpreted in many different ways. We talk about etiquette, especially with asparagus in the book and how you're not supposed to eat it with a fork, either your fingers and or a um, uh, asparagus tongs. And we write about that in the book. And Emily Post would agree with that. As when it comes to removing Again, I go back to Maya Angelou's quote, when you learn, teach. We can't assume that everyone knows hospitality and what etiquette means, right? And I feel the same way when we're at a restaurant. It's, for us, it's something that we know, right? And so I, I call it gentle reminders of how to clear the table. <laughs> but yes, no, Delmonico's was always very, the etiquette level at Delmonico's was extreme. And the staff knew they were trained. You know, it's like there's no such thing as a bad dog, it's the owner kind of a thing, right? So it's kind of like the same thing when it comes to service. If you teach your, your staff how to operate and the etiquette factor, then they'll understand it. But we're in such a high paced world where we don't take that moment to just enjoy. It's like, come in, come out, clear the table, we need the next mm -hmm. table. No, you know, there's a wonderful quote that says, be still and know and be in that moment and enjoy it. 
So thank you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you. There's a question over here. Yeah. Um, and so, Matt, if you agree, we'll just take this question right. and an online question. Yeah. And if you don't mind, I'm going to ask the online question before I speak over to you, sir. And it's basically, it's, um, it's someone who wants to know, now, quite clearly, Max, you embody the Delmonico way. But what about this person wants to know, and she says, wonderful presentation. Thank you. It appears the building is still closed. Mm -hmm. Could you, would you mind saying something about My that? My pleasure. <laughs> My pleasure. Yes, Delmonico's is closed, and it might be for the better for right now. And why do I say that? Well, I received a call. I was going this summer to Italy. We were going with a friend of ours to uh, spend some time in Capri and then to my house in Florence. And I say that only because Italy is where I really get to have like uh, that, that breathing space for me. And I received a call from the landlord and they said, would you like to take over the space? And I said, well, <laughs> what are you trying to kill me early? And so, the rent right now is a little bit astronomical. It's what I believe in, just not yes. Can I talk about this? Okay. <laughs> my attorney's here, who's also my husband. <laughs> but, um, and I can say how much? Okay. So the, the lease right now is $98,000 a month at Delmonico's. Now, that shouldn't discourage someone who has the finances to do it, but it's not only $98,000 a month. We have to also consider employment. We have to consider food. We have to consider renovations. We have a lot of considerations. And so staffing, uh, that wonderful phrase that's going around now, that's like Southern hyperbole, right? <laughs> Is nobody wants to work. And that kind of irks me because people do want to work. However, what we've learned during the pandemic, especially with chefs, is that they know their value, they know their worth. So they're asking for more, you know, money is a mood changer. And if you wanna have excellent staff, you have to pay them more. Um, so it's a big endeavor to take over 12,000 square feet of restaurant space at nearly $100,000 a month, just in rent. My dream, one of them is to take over the speakeasy that my grandfather once had in the basement do an oyster bar and do a prohibition gin bar and bring in the tunes of Katina Renieri to bring in the tunes of Gypsy Rose Lee. And if you don't know, she has a wonderful album where she talks about cooking to bring in the energy of Virginia Graham and Cary Grant and Elizabeth Taylor and that glamorous era. Um, and so I would love to do that. So if there's an investor out there, I'm available. <laughs> but um, in all, you know, it's an interesting, it's an interesting um, position that the building is in right now. Um, I like to say this about not only my life, but about just the moment. And that's, I don't know what the future holds for the Delmonico building, but I know who holds the future. And it's my ancestors. And if your energy doesn't line up with the Delmonico way, as Whoopi Goldberg said, you in danger, girl. <laughs> so I say that because, you know, there's a lot of, of energy in that building. It's an old New York institution, and it has to be honored with dignity, with respect, and in the spirit of the Delmonico way. So it's the phoenix that rises from the ashes, and it will rise again. Yes, thank you. Um, how many diners could dine at, at once? And what were the hours of the restaurant and the evening dining and the private rooms? Wonderful. And that was one of your questions too. So I'm glad it was uh, brought back. So it was usually Monday through Saturday and there was lunch was hectic, obviously. Um, the restaurant closed early in the evenings, usually about eight o'clock in less, in less. Uh, one of the grand dames came and performed. They would stay open until 9.30 or 10 o'clock. But there was a dark hour that my grandfather insisted uh, so that everybody can take that moment to rest because they were getting into from such a long day of work. You know, they would, my grandfather would start at 5.30 in the morning. Um, and so most restaurateurs do if they're, you know, it's in their spirit to be a, a restaurateur. And Oscar Tucci, I think, was the greatest restaurateur that New York had. Um, and so the hours were, were long. And my Aunt Mary would come home sometimes at 12 midnight, one o'clock from being there at six or seven in the morning. 
So naturally, when my grandfather had the, the apartment upstairs, as far as numbers go, um, it all depended on the room. They could, my grandfather, the private rooms were anywhere from 10 to 40. The bigger rooms were to about 350. And so when he did these grand galas that he says, he would be at about 350 people in that room. The room today, for those who have, who have been to Delmonico's in its, in its uh, form now, this was the grand dining room. Perfect timing. Thank you. <laughs> um, so it was massive. And what's interesting is, is that the bar today, this was the hunt room, which I think looks a lot like the polo bar. And this was 19, like early seventies. There's a, so um, what's interesting is, is that the bar that was the original bar is no longer there. And when the BJ group was running Delmonico's, they had to really do a lot of ADA work for, for handicap accessibility. So they had to put a staircase in the middle of the room when you walk in. So it kind of disrupted the flow and the room, then the space started getting smaller. And then they went into the back of the room where they put the bar. So the layout today is not the grand layout that was under the Tucci era. But for the public, Oh, the public could dine there anytime. There was during the day for lunch and it was usually like 11 to about, and then there was that dark period and then to about eight o'clock at night, 8.30 at night. And then Sunday, my grandfather said is the day of rest. He would get in his Cadillac, drive up to Bear Mountain. He would, my aunt Alba, who used to work at the restaurant said he would bury the money up at, at Bear Mountain. <laughs> but um, he insisted for Sundays to be off. And my father was like, we're missing a huge opportunity for Sundays. And so... He, re Donald uh, Robertson did that of, that's Katina Rinieri. But so, um, yeah, he, there was, my, my father reopened on Sundays, which drove my grandfather crazy. So it became Monday through Sunday at one point. And again, from the, they restaurant would open about 10, 30, 11 um, for the stockbrokers to start coming in. And then it would have that dark period right before supper and supper was usually about five, 5.30 to about eight o'clock. Yeah. And that was Caterina That was um, Caterina Rinieri. Caterina Rinieri was, I love to call my aunt. Um, she was an incredible songstress from Florence. Her husband was the, uh, the composer Rizzo Ortolani who did um, the Yellow Rolls Royce, so many uh, wonderful modo cane. And she was the first Italian to ever sing at the Oscars. And when she performed, Sammy Davis Jr. ran up to her, slid on his knees and said, you're gonna be a star. And she was, and I, she passed unfortunately a couple of years ago, but when I would be in Italy, we had so many fond conversations where she would say, I used to go to Delmonico's and the great Liberace would play the piano and I would sing for your father. So it was really a magical time of, of Delmonico's to have Katina Renieri there. Thank you. Oh, we have one more question. Can we stretch it? Just tell me. We'll give him a mic. Yes, we'll give him. Just, just no, but, but for the online audience, it would make them easier to hear them, if you don't mind. Thank you. Max, what a great presentation. Thank you. My name is Fred, and I come from an old line construction company. It goes back to 1849, so I have a lot of history in New York as well. Your passion is exuding, and it's awesome. Thank you. Uh, it's really, really exciting. And the idea that you guys took it from the 20s to the 80s through some turbulent times and made it work. You, you got to make it happen again. You just got to do it. Thank you. So the question I have for you, and I don't mean to load you and put you on the spot, but okay. tell me the difference between your family's restaurant and Francis's Tavern and why it succeeded from 1920 on your administration to where it is today. And how can you maybe revisit that for New York City and make it work again wow. to the next 50 years? Okay. So... Um, Francis Tavern, I, I believe is still open today. I haven't been down there, but I do believe it's still operating. Um, Delmonico's to bring it back today. I like to say I'm available. Um, I do not want to be a restaurateur because I'm not a restaurateur. I have a vision of the past and I have a vision of the future of food and hospitality also. So what I like to say is that I would love to be a consultant on bringing this back. Now, we were just recently in Monte Carlo and um, a friend of mine owns a restaurant there and he felt that same passion that you're feeling now. And he goes, Max, you need to do a Delmonico's. And I said, yes, it's been, you know, I've been approached many times. I just looked at a space in, in New Canaan, Connecticut that was in bank from 1911. 
And I felt that that space could, you know, replicate an era that was fabulous, but now it's not New York. And so for me to link up and give me a moment to process the question, but to link up with a restaurateur, a group that has integrity, dignity, respect, that understands the validation of I see you, I hear you, you matter, that understands hospitality to its core that all are welcome at my table. Until that group is presented to me, there's no way that I could carry my grandfather's legacy and open a place. It would, it would minimize his work. So is there a group out there? Perhaps. And it goes back to the question of, I don't know what the future holds, but I know who holds the future. And if it's meant to be, and if this book was the welcome mat for me to step on, to reach for, I'm a big daydreamer and I say, never stop dreaming. And if that dream is to happen, this book did happen. That beautiful no became that yes. So if that restaurant is supposed to be a yes in my life, I'm available. Thank you. Thank you. And before I wrap it all up, I have to give acknowledgement again to everyone here tonight, to everybody watching, and to my team at Rizzoli, from Charles to Caitlin to Jennifer, the photography in the book, I want to make a point. This was her first cookbook. She's a young lady from Colombia. I had many photographers who wanted to do this book that were calling me. We heard Rizzoli's doing your book. I said, they are. Can we be a part of it? No, it's the divine. No. <laughs> And there was a photographer that we linked up with and there was background chatter that said, this, is this the wild child for Rizzoli? And I said, okay, bringing that energy is not what I'm looking for. And so I took a moment to interview some photographers and I say her name because she is, I want her to be known in this industry. And I phoned Jennifer and I said, Jennifer, why is it you wanna do this cookbook? And she said, it's my dream to do a cookbook. So I paused for a moment and I kind of asked my grandfather, I said, Grand I said, no, no, is this her? And I heard, yes, yes, see, see, see. So I said to her, I said, well, you're gonna have to dream bigger. And she said, why? I said, because you're the photographer of this book. And I canceled seven other photographers that day and she gave her all to this book and Kimberly as well, the food stylist and Phyllis who was the assistant. And this was during pandemic when we were shooting this book. You know, it was like, that was a whole nother feat in trying to put together pictures that could resemble a time of when we couldn't even get lobster. <laughs> so um, we spent a lot of time and I just thank all of my, my team. And there's, I see my Auntie Rolanda is here. So I wanna say hi to Auntie Rolanda. My grandfather would always acknowledge the room. So I don't know, majority of you, those that I do know, I will acknowledge Rolanda. You all remember Rolanda Watts. She had the Rolanda Watts show, the Rolanda show for many years. She was a journalist for ABC. She's an author. She's a friend. I call her my Auntie Ro, and she came here to support us tonight. So thank you, Ro. Mm -hmm. Chad, I see here, he wrote a wonderful piece on me many years ago for Spoiled New York, right? And that was a great article, so thank you. And this gentleman here, we're going to be doing your podcast, The Gilded Gentleman. Carl, thank you for being here. I look forward to your podcast. You can find me on Instagram at Max Tucci. You can find me Sunday nights on Max and Friends and LA Talk Radio. And stay tuned, December 14th, I'm gonna be on the Tamron Hall Show. And I get that Oprah moment. You get a book, you get a book, everybody gets a book. So with that voice and that wow. saying, we have books here tonight. My buddy Clive Davis says, tell them all it's the best holiday gift for under $50. <laughs> wow. So thank you all so much and thank you again. Thank you. Uh, Max, I can only echo Clive Davis's word. This is definitely a fan, fabulous gift. And for online audience, remember, you can go to the website. It's wonderful. It's completely sumptuous. The photographs are fantastic. Thank you. But you, Max, I think your family, your ancestor, to be so proud of you. Your eloquence, you're just an amazing raconteur and how you really did, to repeat myself, you captured the spirit of the Delmonico way, and it lives on because Thank of you. you and will go on in all many different ways that have been hinted at tonight. 
Thank you so much, Max. Thank We've you. been honored Thank to have you, you here. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you all again. And we'll wrap it up. Yeah? I just, I'll just add to Karen's comments. Max, is that everyone know who you are? Oh, I, well, <laughs> no, some walked oh, in. Vic, oh, I'm Victoria Dangle, the executive director of the General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. A kindred spirit with you because I'm second generation General Society of Mechanics and Tradesmen. My father introduced me to this wonderful building when I was 11 years old, planted a seed. It's, uh, a, it's, it's quite the story. And, and so I wanna say to you, thank you so much for bringing to life Delmonico's. But as when, when you finished speaking, it was the, one of the first times we, we've had a lot of lectures where I said, wow, I just when, when it came to Q and A, I said, I just wanna think about everything he said because, and I was really enjoying just sitting there and thinking because I'm gonna retitle your book. It's really the Delmonico way of life. Thank you. Be because you talk about commitment to excellence, you talk about work ethic, you talk about family, you talk about determination, you talk about standards, you talk about elegance, and all of these things that should be celebrated. And I love that you are so positively in touch with generations, because in life, and whether it's a country or a family relationship or a person, it's so important to learn what you have, what you celebrate in that person, uh, because it leads to such great things. You have fabulous energy. So please, you have a new home on 44th Thank Street. You. I love it. I'm Come moving again. in. <laughs> there's, room, there's room up there. We love you. Thank, Thank you, you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, and just to find, we have a little memento oh, for wonderful. you. The, Thank you. The, post, the, the poster. Um, Max will now be signing books, and I'm sure you probably still have questions for him, but you can yeah. ask them at the book signing table. And I do just want to mention our last lecture of the fall will be a block in time in New York history of Fifth Avenue and 23rd Street with author Christiana Bird. And that's next Tuesday, December 6th. Thank you all so much for coming. Please join us for a glass of wine. Our online audience, thank you very much, you. Max a million. I'm going to leave the room with one more uh, tidbit. You know, yesterday, what's today, Wednesday? Yesterday yeah. was Giving Tuesday. Is that correct? Yeah. And I know the importance of giving back. And so I know that this institution depends a lot on donations, right? So they do. Thank you. You don't Thank say you. no to donations. Yeah. I know. I'll say it for yeah. you. So for those of you who are listening and watching, to keep these going, you are needed. You are needed to, um, to not only be involved in spirit and in person, but also financially are needed. So my next book tour, I'll be doing a percentage of sales that I'll give to you. Oh, All right? Thank for you. my next book. Oh, thank, you. So really. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank the book so signing much. will start in yes. one moment. Thank okay. You. Thank you Wonderful. so much again, Matt. Thank you. <laughs>